to all of you to this morning's worship service and as we gather in worship here in St. Macken. And also a very warm welcome to all of you who will be watching the recording of the service later on on YouTube, on Facebook or on the church's website, whether you are at home or whether you're in pajamas in your bed or gathered in the living room with your whole family together. It is wonderful for us to uh, share in worship together wherever we are. Um, just a few uh, intimations just for today. Um, the church services for March, just a reminder that we'll be moving back to St. Nicholas for the month of March for the four Sundays. Then also next Sunday, um, as always, on the first Sunday of every month, we share in Holy Communion together. So if you are going to watch the recording at home, please make sure that you have uh, your elements of bread and wine ready to share in communion if you wish to do so. Then on Monday the, um, Monday the 7th of March, uh, we're going to start with a Lent Bible study that will be held on Zoom. Um, and it's all the churches within the Council of Churches for this area in Ox Apple and Roxburgh. Uh, it's going to start at 7.30 on the Monday evening. And it's um, based on the Chosen series, uh, which is a series about Jesus' life and the people he chose to be his followers and how that impacts our lives as we are the chosen of Jesus as well. Then uh, we also have a congregational conversation on Sunday the 13th of March uh, in, in two Sundays time. It will be directly after the morning service in St. Nicholas Church. Um, it, it's going to be a little bit of a shorter church service so that we can have a good uh, congregational chat, as I would like to say, but a conversation to just uh, speak about um, the changes and the things that are happening. I know perhaps a lot of you have heard about uh, presbytery reform and changes within different areas with all over Scotland with churches coming together um, and there are lots of rumours already around so this is a chance for us to just uh, put all the facts on the table and if you're in interested to uh, come and just have a listen at what's going on and what's going to happen. Um, then you are more than welcome <coughs> to join us excuse me, for the congregational conversation. Then um, the World Day of Prayer is this coming Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. in Apple South Church. Um, it's a beautiful uh, um, liturgy that was written by women of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we had a lovely planning meeting just um, there on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, and really excited to hold a World Day of Prayer event again in person for the first time in a, in a couple of years. So uh, all are welcome if you want to come and join us uh, to pray for the world. And then just a reminder that the Wednesday prayer meeting uh, takes place every Wednesday uh, from 6 to 6.45 in Apple Community Centre. And if you have any prayer requests, um, you can contact Sheena Carroll and the prayer team would be um, more than willing to uh, just pray for you. I think that's all that we have on slides. Then, um, as I intimated last week, um, Mary Watson passed away on the 15th of February and her funeral will take place in St. Nicholas Church on Wednesday, the 2nd of March at a quarter past one, 1.15 uh, in St. Nicholas Church and it will be followed by a committal service at West Lothian Crematorium at 2 p.m. Mr. Jack Watson just asked me to intimate it to you all. But we are here to worship God together. Let's take a few moments, take a deep breath, and as we prepare in, for worship, we are going to sing our opening hymn, Fill Your Hearts with Joy and Gladness.
dear friends, um, this week was quite a heavy week for the world and I thought it would be prudent for us to start this morning as a congregation, as a church, as brothers and sisters in Christ with the people of Ukraine. So today we especially stand in solidarity with them as we approach God in worship this morning. Whether we know friends or perhaps have someone that we know has family living there, the people of Ukraine are in our thoughts and in our hearts and minds, as well as our prayers for their safety and peace and for God's comfort to be with them. We also pray for the people of Russia who stand in protest against the unprovoked war, a war that many of them do not want. And as we heard last week, we should love our enemies. We also pray for President Putin to see reason and to realize the error of his ways and to change his decisions and his course of action. We also pray for the rest of the world, for NATO and for the G7 and the world leaders to have the wisdom and the courage to do what is necessary to protect the most lives possible during this unnecessary act of evil. So as we approach our God in worship today, these words from Psalm 99 are actually very apt for us to listen to. The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name, for you are holy. The King is mighty and he loves justice. You have established equity. In Jacob you have done what is right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. For he is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them from the pillar of cloud, and they kept his statutes and the decrees he gave them. Lord our God, you answered them. You were to Israel a forgiven God though you punish their misdeeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. So it is in the name of this holy God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that I greet you today and say to you grace and peace to you. And we pray for peace for the world. Amen. We're going to join our hearts and our minds together as one. And at the end of this prayer, we are going to say the Lord's Prayer together. And the words will appear on the screen for you. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy God. To you we come some rejoicing, some in sorrow, but we come because we know who you are. You are light and in you there is no darkness at all. You are faithful and true and there is nothing false about you. You have shown us how much you love us in Jesus Christ, who became one of us and for our salvation. Freely and gladly we bring ourselves to you. Holy Spirit, we pray, help us that with all that is within us, we may worship your holy name. Gracious God, we ask for eyes open to see your glory in the world around, for ears to hear Jesus speak today, and for mind ready to engage with your thoughts. 
for hearts to love you more and our neighbours as ourselves. Help us to see that all you have commanded us to be is found in Jesus. Good Shepherd, may you show us the paths of right living that lead to refreshing streams and green pastures for all the earth. Saviour God, whose well-meaning disciples sometimes miss the point, we pray that you would help us to keep our focus on you. Forgive us, we humbly ask, when we have been overtaken by our own projects rather than to nurture the life of your kingdom. We have looked other ways and have not been mindful of you. We have hurt others and we have hurt ourselves. Draw us close, we pray, and may you speak words of forgiveness within each of our own hearts. We pray that you would reignite the fire of faith and inspire in us with the breath of your Holy Spirit new ways of being with you and being with one another. With the glory of Jesus Christ reflected upon our faces, may we shine for you each day. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our friend, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning to all of you who are young of age and heart and mind and all of you um, with us here in church this morning. Um, I brought something from home again, um, something that I know some people really like and other people really don't like. I've heard someone say just a couple of weeks ago, when I have to look in a mirror, I do it quickly because I really don't like it. So I don't know um, how many of you like to look in the mirror in the morning when you wake up. For some of us, um, I think the mirror can sometimes be a bit um, ungracious if we get up in the morning and we have to look at it. But the mirror is a wonderful image that we find um, in the Bible. It's a wonderful way for us to think about um, what we are called to do. When we're going to read the reading for this morning, the text that we're going to listen to, the, the few words that we're going to read from the Bible, it speaks about the fact that we reflect God's light. And that's an interesting thing for us to think about because that means that the light that God is, the love that God is, the goodness that God is, is something that we can reflect to the world. So it's not sometimes nice for us to look at them in the mirror and look at our own reflections, but something um, that I think that is really important for us to do is that when we do look in the mirror that we are a bit more gracious with ourselves. The Bible teaches us that we are the image of God. So as we look in the mirror we actually see something of God reflected back to us and it's something that we can remind ourselves of when we particularly feel a little bit low that we are a reflection of God's love for the world. So. I was taught um, when I was a teenager by one of my Sunday school teachers that when you stand in front of the mirror and when you look at the mirror, you say to yourself, I am God's child. Whether you like what you see or whether you don't like what you see, you are God's child. And the way that we reflect God's love in the world is a way for people to know God and to see God. So that's what we're going to be thinking about today is how do we do that? How do we reflect God's love and God's light to the world around us so that those we encounter and those we see so that they can know that God loves them too. So next time you look in the mirror, be a bit more gracious, tell yourself that you are a child of God and that God loves you. And as you accept that, that you can spread and reflect the love of God in the world around you. 
So to that end, we are going to sing a wonderful children's hymn, someone, um, as one of my favorite ones. Um, and I know some of um, one of our church members' favorite one as well. We're going to sing This Little Light of Mine. This the light of mine. Second Corinthians chapter 3 and at verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who had put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. Who is the Spirit, present weakness and resurrection life. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. 
Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not to ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and our ser ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that all is surpassing power is from God and not from us. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this the reading of his holy word. Thank you, Robert, for doing that reading for us. Many churches across the world today will celebrate what is known as Transfiguration Sunday. It's a very big word. The last, that is the last Sunday of the season of Epiphany in the liturgical calendar of the church year. That is the last Sunday before Ash Wednesday, which is coming up this, uh, this Wednesday, the 2nd of March, and before the start of Lent. Now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, imagine that we have seasons in the church like we have seasons in the year, spring, summer, autumn and winter, except that in the church year we have more than just four and they divide the church year into different periods where we focus on specific themes. The well-known ones are Advent and Christmas and Lent and Easter. But there's also Epiphany and Pentecost and Ordinary Time. So during the church year, we also have special Sundays where we focus on specific texts in the Bible within the cycle of the seasons of the church year. Perhaps you'll remember last year at the end of November, just before the start of Advent, we celebrated Sunday of Christ the King. Just as we have all these other special Sundays like Harvest and Mothering Sunday, we also have special Sundays that focus specifically on Jesus. And today is one of them, and it's called Transfiguration Sunday. Like I said, it's a big word, Transfiguration, which is found in the text of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, where the story is told of Jesus who took his disciples three of them, Peter, James and John, with him to climb a mountain to go and pray. And as Jesus was praying, something happened to him. His appearance was changed and his clothes shone brightly as a flash of lightning, the text says. In the original language of Greek, it simply says, Jesus became other. He became different. He changed. And this description is used to tell us that there were no words for the disciples to describe exactly what they'd seen Jesus become, possibly because it was too much for them to understand. So this mountaintop of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke with his disciples also remind us of another mountaintop experience in the Bible. When Moses went up Mount Sinai to meet God, who gave them the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone to give to the Israelites. When Moses came down the mountain, he was, his face was covered with a veil because his face was so lit with the glory of God that it scared the people of Israel. Another encounter with God, with one of his other prophets, was when Elijah went onto a mountain top and the wind raged and the lightning struck and the earth shook and Elijah looked for God in these big events 
But God told him to turn his back so God could pass by him for his own safety. Because it would have been too much for him to see the face of God fully and to live to tell the tale. The reason being, of course, that sometimes God is for us too great to comprehend, too big for our understanding. It's too hard for us to try and imagine what God is like because he is so different, so other. So if we look at our reading uh, for today, the one we read from 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul understood something about the glory of God that is too big for us to understand, too much for us to handle. And he wants his friends in the church of Corinth to realize that even though we say that, even though we know that, that God is too much for us to understand, God can still be revealed to us. God can still show himself in ways for us to be able to say, that must have been God that I encountered. And he illustrates this by contrasting Moses on Mount Sinai to the mountaintop of Jesus, where Jesus was in God's glory. Paul says it is Jesus who is proclaimed as Lord, and we are servants for Jesus' sake. In other words, by living as Jesus lived, by following in his footsteps and living his way, we are in fact able to experience the glory of God. And unlike Moses and Elijah, we have no reason to cover our faces or to turn our backs, because through Jesus, we have the glory of God with us each and every day. A few weeks ago, as we sat here in St. Macken, we spoke about seeing clearly through a different set of lenses. I asked, I asked you, who of you need glasses to see better? And it's for us as Christians, a way of looking at the world differently because we have a different viewpoint. We approach life in a different way. We approach life through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the new life that we have because of him. We also read from the letter of the Corinthians then, from the first letter. So this is kind of a recurring theme for us uh, as we read in the second chapter uh, or the second book, the sec second letter from Corinthians as well. There is a different way for us to look at life, not veiled, not covered, not turning our backs towards God, but to have the mind of Christ, to be changed and to be continuously changed and transformed and transfigured. But sometimes in our lives, our vision does become a little bit obscured. We either get distracted by the many demands that life places upon us or our priorities change so that our faith and our beliefs take a bit of a backseat and we start to focus on the things that we think are more important than our faith and our relationship with God. Many people have the notion that to live a Christian life is to follow a prescribed list of principles and rules. If I do this or that, then I will get into heaven. In this week, uh, one of the teenagers asked me in our Bible study group, is our faith the same as so many other faiths in the world where we have to do this and this and this and it's almost like a point-based system for us to get into heaven? And it was so joyful for me to be able to explain to her that that's exactly the opposite of what God's love and God's grace means to us. And to see the little light go on in her head, to understand that our faith does not work like that. It all falls apart when we think about faith like that, that we need to do a bunch of good things, a list of good things. Because when a crisis then occurs, we think to ourselves, how can something bad happen to me when I've tried to be such a good person? Some other people are led to believe that all we need to do 
is to accept Jesus and then everything else in our lives will magically fall into place. But as we read from the letter to the Corinthians, we see that Paul speaks about faith in a different way. He says that faith is not only a single moment in our lives that is a point of conversion for us, but instead it is a work in progress. Sometimes it happens like it happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. There was a point of conversion, but he says throughout all his letters that his conversion is a lifelong process, an ongoing process of having to change and having to rethink about the way that we think about God's love and God's light for the world. Paul makes a reference to Moses who had experienced the presence of God in a very powerful way on Mount Sinai. Moses saw the face of God and then he became a deliverer of the law. For the Hebrews, the law of God was etched in stone. But Paul contrasts that event with the life of Jesus. Paul wants us as his listeners to understand that the way to see the face of God is through our hearts. So how can we then experience the glory of God? How can we see the face of God in everyday life all around us? I think the texts help us in three ways. Paul mentions three things that really strikes us as we read this text. He starts by telling us that to experience the glory of God or to see clearly is to first realize that we are already free. In Jesus Christ, there is nothing that we have to do to be able to gain our freedom. He says, now the Lord is the spirit and the way the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. With Moses, the people of faith needed the law. They needed something to guard their hearts and their minds. For as we read in this text, it says that um, thou shalt not steal. In the text that we read this morning, it says that we need to speak about truth, which we're going to look at in a minute. But there was certain, a, a certain list of laws that the people needed to follow. And if you were caught stealing, if one of the laws said you are not allowed to steal, you knew that you would pay the consequences. There would be consequences for your actions. But as Christians, we know that stealing is wrong because it's offensive and it's harmful to the community. We don't steal, not, because, not only because it's against the law, but also because we love our neighbors. And one way of showing them this love is to respect their property and not steal it. In other words, we are free of the need to steal or even the thought of it. Secondly, Paul says that the glory of God is manifested in us when we speak the truth. He writes, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And the writer Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, the greatest homage we pay to truth is simply to use it. One of uh, the history's um, biggest names that spoke the truth was a man named Galileo and he was both a scientist and a devout Christian and he shocked the Catholic Church by proclaiming the th theory that the earth was round and that it evolved around the sun. As we know the church denounced Galileo as a heretic and he spoke the truth but was condemned for it. It wasn't until centuries later that Galileo was exonerated. Galileo was willing to stand by the truth in spite of public humiliation. And in the long run, the truth prevailed as society began to accept the truth of his theory. So speaking the truth, standing up for what is right and saying when something isn't right is what the second thing is we can do to experience the glory of God. The third thing is to experience the glory of God is not only to receive it, but to reflect it. 
It is when we use opportunities to let the love and the light of God reflect from us that we realize we are in the presence of God and experiencing God's glory. The basic premise of Paul's message here is not that we see God more clearly, not that we have somehow managed to get a handle on God any better than anyone else, and not that we have God now all figured out. We see God when we become a reflection of God. It is a life of service, living in the image of God, where we will experience the glory of God. Too many people perhaps have the notion that to experience God, it must be a wonderful and emotional high. And don't get me wrong, sometimes it is, but they want to be fed and lifted up and blown away. They want moments of ecstasy where they can visualize or feel the glory of God. But God can be seen when we are reflecting God's love, when we are doing the good works that God called us to do, and when we are living the image of God. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 4 we read, says it all for us. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus Christ. And then verse 7, perhaps for me personally, in my own faith, one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We experience the glory of God every time that we let our light shine. We experience the glory of God when we realize that the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, we experience the glory of God when we have the courage to tell the truth. So my challenge to you this week is as you go about your week and as you look around you at the world and your experiences and whatever happens to you in this week, to look for a chance to experience the glory of God. It may not be all glorious, but it could be in the simple act of realizing what a privilege it is to support someone who needs you, to pray for someone who asks for it, to be a friend, to give without asking, to smile at a stranger, to be a welcome presence for someone who really needs it. Or when any of these things happen to you, for you yourself to realize and acknowledge that it's God's glory and goodness to you, and then to be thankful for it. So may we go out and may we go and reflect the love of God through Jesus Christ who reigns in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us to transfigure and transform us continuously as we live our lives. Amen. We're going to sing our next hymn, uh, the beautiful hymn, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
This morning, I want to take the chance to specifically pray uh, for the Ukraine as well. So after our own intercessory prayers, I'm, I'm going to do a prayer for the people of Ukraine and for the world for peace. Let us join our hearts and our minds together as one. Let us pray. Our holy, holy, holy God, we give you thanks for every good and holy joy. We give you thanks for all that you have made for each and every one of us in our unique diversity. We thank you for the gifts of eye and ear and for the varied ways in which we can experience you and see your presence in this world. We thank you for animals and plants, mountains and rivers and seas, countries and people so varied and so beautiful. All that points to you. Transfigured Jesus, crucified, risen and ascended Lord, who gives gifts to humankind. We thank you for all that you have done for us and for the love with which you reach out to every human being. For the presence of your life-giving spirit in the church, in our world and in our lives, we give you our thanks. For the liberty the Spirit brings to be whose we truly are and to work out together what it means to be church in these days, we give you thanks. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would move us and prompt us and to show us how to reflect Christ's glory, that many may, the, may know the light of Christ that is within them. Receive our gifts and our prayers, we humbly ask as we offer them in faith and love. We also pray for the church, for ourselves and for each other. We look to the day when all of creation will be set free from decay and to enter into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We pray for the world around us as we pray for the climate crisis that world governments may not falter in their commitments to reduce global temperatures. Lord God, who has made it known that you love justice and equity, we pray for a better sharing of the world's resources, for an end to poverty and inequality. You invite us to collaborate with you and our brothers and sisters towards the day when your kingdom is complete and poverty and injustice will be no more. Compassionate Jesus, we also pray for all who are ill at home or in hospital, all who are grieving the loss of someone they loved. And we bring to you now the people we would ask you to bless in moments of quiet as we pray for them. gracious God as Lent approaches and as we journey with Jesus towards the cross may we ever be aware of your glory this morning Lord we pray for the people of Ukraine in this week we saw the most unbelievable act of war of evil of power corrupting and threatening the lives of innocent people and we ask that you would hear our prayer for peace among the nations and for an end of conflict in Ukraine living God who shall judge between the nations we ask that you would lead the nations in the paths of peace and that the dividing wall of hostility will be broken down and in your mercy Lord we ask Hear our prayers. Our older brother in faith, the Apostle Paul, knew full well that we would find it almost impossible to pray in times of deep darkness. He tried to reassure us that the Spirit will intercede for us when our words fail. We know this feeling, the feeling of the inadequacy of our words. But right now, dear Lord, 
the people of the Ukraine know it even better. Holy Spirit, please pray for them and with them and with us. Intercede for us where our words feel empty. As we pray for the old man who signed up to fight to save his grandchildren, and for the women lifting mattresses to cover their windows, and for the soldiers who confidently said goodbye to their loved ones, and for hundreds of people undercover in underground stations, for the thousands fleeing and trying to escape evil. Lord Jesus, we don't want to remember that just last week you reminded us that we need to love our enemies and that we also need to pray for them too. So this morning we do. We pray for Mr. Putin and his rulers and his army to seize the attacks on innocent people to let them have a change of heart and mind. We pray for the rest of the world and the world leaders that need to make decisions on our behalf and all who can stop this war to do what they can to bring peace and to save as many lives as possible. We also pray for the people of Russia who are protesting against this war from the inside and for all of us protesting from around the world that this war must end as soon as possible, for it never should have even started. And we also pray for ourselves, for you called us to be peacemakers. So we pray that you would guard our hearts and our minds, so we will not vilify one race against another, one people against another. And we pray that you would bring us your peace here on earth. And where our words fail, Holy Spirit, intercede for us. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is How Lovely on the Mountains.
So as we leave this place, we return to the needs of the world. May you know that Christ goes before you and that there is no way that you will be without him. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen.